So it seems as though that when we first started having grandkids that all of them were enthralled with superheroes. So when Maddox had his birthday recently, um, it had a superhero theme to it. You know what I'm saying? And um, Selma, we've got, we've got eight grandkids, five boys and three girls. Selma is the second in birth order. She's Sarah's. And she just turned two. And some way or another, she found one of her brother's Sp Spider-Man costumes. And so the other day, she put on the Spider-Man costume, and Sarah thought, well, it just, you know, she puts it, put it on that morning. Well, she would not take it off. Look at her hands kind of folded in defiance. I am not taking it off. And they are just all about, you know, superheroes. And it's kind of a hot item, right? And so our culture, I mean, the kids kind of, are tracking along the culture because our culture has this fascination with superheroes and has for some years now. Uh, the comic book heroes of yesterday are the subject of current day live action movies. I won't have you raise your hands if uh, you've been to see one lately, but you know, some of them with the aid of computer generated graphics are pretty good. Batman, Superman, Spider Man. Batman versus Superman, Captain America versus Iron Man, Iron Man, and on and on and on the list goes. Today's superheroes, and you may know this, were born during the Depression era and World War II. Superman first appeared in 1938 and Batman in 1939, and these times were marked by hardship. My uncle came up from Carlsbad, New Mexico uh, this last week, and, <clears throat> and so I went down and got he and my mother, and, and um, they came up and stayed with us uh, overnight. But we were driving around Fort Cobb Lake because that's where my family's, that's where my family on my mother's side were. They, um, I don't know how they do that. The Corps of Engineers, you know, they condemn the land and then they take it. So they had to move. But we were talking about how the Depression shaped my grandfather and the impact that that had. When hard times hit, a lot of times it marks us. We feel powerless and hopeless, disenfranchised. Superheroes provide hope and inspiration against all of those evil forces. A curator in a exhibition or exhibit in Los Angeles on classic comic book art said this, in the 1930s, the American dream had become a nightmare, and I think comic books and superheroes in particular provided an escape form of entertainment that allowed the American public to go into a fantasy world where all of their Ill ills of the world were righted by these larger-than-life heroes. John Eldridge, in his book, Wild at Heart, says, we are born into this world. One of the things he says is we are born with an adventure to live. And this morning, what I want to do is look at some of these larger-than-life heroes, not from comic books or from American culture, but these stories that come to us of great heroes of faith, super superheroes of the Bible. This is not, and looking at these and hearing their story is not escapist fantasy. It's real world stuff because these were real people. They, were, they weren't made up people. And they lived in tough times when people felt powerless and hopeless and maybe disenfranchised. And you look back at those people in Scripture and the faith that they had. Regular folks like us overcoming challenges, obstacles, difficulties, by the power of God working in their lives. They lived a great adventure. And I think we can find hope and inspiration for our lives in their story, and that their story, this is the way the Bible works. 
is we expose ourselves to that story, that narrative, and then that informs our story, our narrative. The first one, and when you think about superheroes of the Bible, the place to start, I think, on an adventure of faith is you have to start with Abram, right? Okay, yeah, right. Just say right. There you go. His name meant exalted father. Later, after he believed in God and God would give him descendants without number, God called him Abraham, which means father of multitudes. He was the poster boy of faith. He was the ancestor, is the ancestor of three different religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And Christianity alone, there are 2.2 billion followers. When the writers of the New Testament needed an example of faith, they turned to this superhero, this first one, the story of Abraham. And so the question as we start this morning on this Communion Sunday is what does this adventure, what does his adventure teach us? We catch the beginning of Abram's life. The story begins before chapter 12. Abram is listed as the son of Terah in the genealogical order in chapter 11. And then the beginning of chapter 12, God speaks to Abram and says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and to your father's house to the land that I will show you. It almost seems when you read that story that it's sort of an out-of-the-blue kind of conversation that you know, God just shows up one day and has this conversation. I really don't think it's the first time that they had talked, though. And that's just an assumption on my part. Abraham was 75 years old when this conversation took place. Think about that. He had already migrated from the Chaldean city of Ur to Haran, and his wife, who was 60, Sarah was 65 years old, and they'd never had children. I believe Abraham had talked to God prior to this, is my assumption. But it seems that this conversation is different, maybe, than other conversations they had. This was a call. You sense this call, this plan, this imperative, this order from God this God who created the universe, and he wanted Abram to leave everything that was comfortable, everything that he held dear, his country, his family, his kindred, his father who was still alive, and go to a land that God would show him. What's interesting about the story is if you had that conversation, listen, you couldn't Google where you were going because God didn't give him the name of the destination. God just called him and said, I'm going to send you to a place that I want to send you. It didn't tell him the name of the place. And Abraham went. And so the first point that I want to share with you today is this, is that we can say about Abraham's adventure, it started and depended on a call from God. Now, I think... Let me qualify what I'm saying here. I, I think God calls every one of us in some form or fashion to serve him. I think God calls some of us to teach Sunday school and work in the nursery and, you know, do different things. I won't uh, be a laborer of that, all of that whole list of things. And I believe God calls some of us to be pastors, the odd ones, let's just say. I think unless God compels you to be a pastor, you shouldn't do it. I have been a mentor to several in my career, and uh, Matt Judkin is down in, in uh, McAllister at the First Methodist Church, and I was his mentor, and Matt reminds me every once in a while when I see him, and he's doing a great job, by the way. He said, because I, I tell him, and I, this is what was told me, and I just, I was a good mentoree, I guess is I usually tell them, if you can do anything else, do it. But if you can't, then you need to surrender and go into the ministry. And, you know, I don't know why God called me into the ministry. You know, I always thought he had a sense of humor for doing it. 
I mean, because I'm not better or smarter or more good looking than anybody else. But maybe that's the way things happen. I realized when I was in my late teens that God was calling me. Maybe uh, God knew that that was the only way I would stay awake through an entire sermon if I was preaching it. Uh, and I don't know. I didn't know then where this would take me, and, you know, to a large part, I still don't know. Part of the, now listen, part of the adventure is responding to that call by faith. Not knowing exactly where it's going to lead you, but trusting God to show the way when the time comes. I'm going to tell an old story. Uh, sometimes God uses hardship to show us what he wants us to do. Um, difficult times in a person's life sometimes move us to uh, define that will and that better direction for our lives. Former President Jimmy Carter was, is a deep man of faith, as you know, and he credits God for bringing him through some rough parts of his adventure. In 1966, Jimmy Carter was upset at the amount of racism in the state of Georgia and decided that he would run for governor against a self-avowed segregationist, Lester Maddock. He was soundly, Carter was soundly defeated. And he was angry at God for allowing him to be defeated. But his sister quoted a passage of scripture from James chapter 1 verse 2. Listen to what she said. She quoted this scripture. Whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may mature, may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Jimmy Carter thought his political career was over, that God had rejected him. His sister Ruth, and through his sister Ruth, he was encouraged. Ruth said, Jimmy, you've got to believe that out of this defeat, your life can be greater than it would have been. She advised him to try something totally unrelated to his business, to his politics. In his book, Living Faith, Jimmy Carter says this, Christ gave me courage to take a chance on something new. Shortly afterward, I was asked by the Baptist Brotherhood to go on a lay witness mission in Pennsylvania, I don't know if you've ever if you've ever gone on a lay witness mission, but they're pretty amazing. So he was asked to go on this lay witness mission, and he said, "I did, and it changed my life." Ten years later, this defeated politician and peanut farmer became the next president of the United States. Trusting in God can take us to a new place. Having faith in God and taking a chance and allow God leading us opens up new possibilities. This is part of the adventure. Abram launched out to Cana. What is God calling you to do? I know we've just done a series through Lent on serve. This is a reminder because maybe you're not hooked up yet. You know, New Covenant says, Jay probably said it. I don't remember if he said it this morning. Worship plus two, right? <clears throat> worship is at the heart. God wants us to worship, and then we are involved in a small group or Sunday school class so we can grow and have some accountability. And then the second thing, that's good. That's, that's strong. I like that. Um, second thing is we serve. We're going to celebrate that today at the picnic, that many of you have found a place that you serve uh, in the ways that you can. What is God, what else maybe? Or some of you, they're not serving. What's God calling you to do? Because quickly following the call was a promise. And that's the second thing. Abram was willing to risk everything in order to follow. This 75-year-old guy, he was supposed to be in his golden years, right? He should have been living easy on his shepherd's pension. I mean, when you're 75 years old, you're supposed to, if you're going to relocate, you're going to relocate to a place where people take care of you, right? But Cana can hardly fit that description. 
It was a grueling trek of, of 350 miles across the desert. And when they got there, when Abram got there with all those that were with him, they discovered that the land wasn't empty. It was occupied, the Canaanites that were there. And God didn't tell the Canaanites that Abraham was coming and that, they had, that God had given Abraham their land. God gave Abram a promise of great blessing. Listen to what he said. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curse you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Some of our staff today, I think they all must be down in the cafe Ruby's here. Jay, are you up in the sound booth? Oh, they're probably getting ready for the picnic, don't you think? Ruby can't stand up because she has a broke leg. Actually, she had surgery. But you see that T-shirt she has on? It's got this thing on there that we call a hashtag, we love new cove. Now, hashtag is what we used to call what? Pound sign. Now it's called a hashtag. And if you were to type in a social media application, either Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, you type a hashtag and you put in the word right after the hashtag, blessed, it would bring up everybody who's used that hashtag and word, hashtag blessed. And it's fairly interesting. On Facebook, hashtag blessed, brings up products like Wendy's and Oreo cookies and Reese's Buttercups and Fiat cars. You want to be blessed? It also brings up celebrity pages like a variety of them, like LeBron James and Michael Blue Blay and Paris Hilton, and they're all hashtag blessed. And even Pope Francis is in the list. He is blessed on Facebook. No surprise there, right? Most of the social media blessings, though, are pretty materialistic, except maybe for the Pope. Wealth, fame, possessions, looks. I mean, there's some people that are proud of, well, anyway, exotic travels. Um, frankly, God's promised blessings to Abram they're concrete, they're measurable in terms of land and a great name and lots of descendants. But we know that the real blessing of God is more than what we possess, our materialism, right? Or we might say it like this if we were really bold in our preaching and say, or what possesses us, our materialism. Most of us are abundantly blessed with material things. Most everybody in this room particularly compared to the amount of wealth in, on the globe. Americans are very blessed. We're abundantly blessed with material things. But the blessings that God's talking about, I think, are deeper than our stuff. We're blessed with family and friends and a great church community and love and health and freedom, and the list goes on. When you get to the New Testament and Jesus starts talking about blessing, what does he talk about? Well, listen, let me just give you the list. When Jesus talks about blessed, he's talking about blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. And blessed are the persecuted. That's a different list than when you go on Facebook and do hashtag blessed. You don't see much of this on that. We inherit this lintage. 
we inherit from our ancestors of faith this blessedness that's deeper than the things that we possess or that possess us. Peter in the second sermon of the book of Acts said this, you are the descendants of the prophets and of the covenant that God gave your ancestors saying to Abraham and in your descendants all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so the final thing I want to say this morning about this heritage is we're called we're called to be blessed and the third thing we're called for a purpose. Abram like Abram we are called not only to be blessed but we're blessed to be a blessing. God said to Abram, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. In all of the families of the earth, all of them shall be blessed. Abraham did become a blessing. He and Sarah had a son. His name was Isaac. And Isaac had a son, Jacob. And on it goes. And within three generations, we have a nation, Israel. Today, believers in three religions, millions of people call Abraham their father. That's the great thing about the promises of God, of faith. If God makes a promise, God keeps his promises. The psalmists knew over and over again that God was faithful. People of faith are blessed no matter what. And God takes us on a journey in our blessing to be a blessing to others. I'll tell you a story as we close. Lois Seacrest was born as a modern-day Abram. When she was a young teenager, 15 years old, in 1929, 27, she felt God calling her to be a missionary to go to a foreign place to help the poor, to offer help and assistance to the needy, and to share Christ. She felt God calling her to go on a trip of mercy, but her life took another turn. Instead, she married a farmer named Galen Prater. In 1935, Galen developed a problem with alcoholism. Later in his life, Galen gave his life to Christ. And when he gave his life to Christ, Christ delivered him from the problem of alcoholism. In Galen's later years, they lived a pretty happy life, although there were hardships. Galen died in 1988. Galen and Lois were married for over 50 years. She was at 76. Lois began to feel that call of God on her life that she felt when she was 15. And that call was to become a missionary. She was virtually the same age as Abram was, as Abraham was, when Abraham began his adventure. She wanted to fulfill this long call that had been delayed for so long in her life. But here's the problem, is when churches, when denominations found out how old she was, nobody would take her. She was too old. She was outside the profile. So she had enough friends that she gathered up enough private donations and, and monies that she decided to start a mission in the Philippines. In 1999, when she was 87 years old, she built a house for 35 orphans, ages 8 months to 10 years old. Each one of them were totally destitute. If you know anything about that Filipino culture. They called her Lola, which means in their language, grandmother, in their native tongue. She named her mission King's Garden Children's Home. Lois died in 2013 at the age of 101. These are some pictures I pulled off their website from 2015. Uh, children's Garden, or King's Garden Children's Home. 
A reporter asked Lois if her lack of denominational support made her nervous, and she replied with confidence, I serve a mighty God. He's in control. I feel I'm not talented enough to do this, to do any of this, but God enables me. My responsibility is to do what I can. It's still going. Let me ask you as we close some, some reflective questions. I know y'all do a lot of stuff. This church couldn't be as great as it is without all that you do. And we celebrate that. We're going to celebrate that today. But what adventure do you think God has in mind for you? Did, did you... Did you think that age would be an issue? Sorry. What do you think his call is on your life? Because I think everybody has a call. Did I say that to you earlier? How will you be a blessing to others how will you be a blessing to this community and in this world? Maybe you can't put an exotic location on Facebook and say, hashtag blessed. But God still uses us. God blesses those who will make an adventure of faith. Let me close with this. You know the three greatest words in the Bible, maybe, three greatest words, at least in this story. Let me tell you what they were. So, Abram went. Let me repeat that. Three greatest words. God's doing all this. They're talking. He says, I want you to go to a place, I'm not going to tell you what the name of it is. You can't Google it. And it says, so, Abram went. What about you? During our communion, I want you to reflect on that and ask God to show you what he wants you to do, where he wants you to be a blessing. If those are